Well, thank you, Bill. Good morning. Let me uh, add my welcome to uh, our national conference here in Seattle this year. We're really pleased that you could join us. Uh, our team really appreciates your participation and support. As Bill and Jorge pointed out, this tremendous turnout this year. We're really excited about the lineup we've got. I think you'll find your investment of time and money to be a, a good one, that you'll get a good return on it. Our team at APPA this year has done another outstanding job of assembling what I think is a really terrific collection of panels and speakers to provide information and insights into the many challenges that public power faces in today's environment. So what I, I thought I'd do today is start off by talking a little bit about that environment. Then I'd like to share with you some of the challenges that public power faces today. I think many of you are familiar with a lot of those. Talk a little bit about the initiatives that we've undertaken uh, at the direction of the board and through our planning and budgeting process to assist our members. And then wrap up with a perspective on the outlook and how we're positioned for the future. Let me start by talking a little bit about the economy. Uh, kind of a combination of good news and, and bad news there. The good news is, I was surprised to learn in looking at this, that our economy is actually greater, has grown more than it was before the pre-recession peak. The 2011 uh, total GDP was greater than in 2007. Uh, the exports have been expanding, manufacturing has been growing, uh, productivity has been up, and if you look at corporate balance sheets, Profits have been pretty good the last year or two, and there's nearly $2 trillion being held by U.S. corporations right now. Unfortunately, you know, the after effects of the crash in 2008 are still lingering. The, the recovery's been pretty tepid, you know, right around 2% growth in GDP. Typical recovery is closer to 4%. As you're aware, uh, employers are still reluctant to hire. Unemployment persists above 8% in the last jobs report. Housing market still has a way to go. And our national debt is nearly the size of our entire economy. As I think a lot of you are aware, a state and local jurisdictions are under a lot of financial pressure, continuing to cut budgets, uh, cut jobs. The last jobs report in May showed some modest hiring increases by the private sector, but the public sector is still cutting jobs, and the rating agencies have uh, local governments on a negative outlook. So I think you could conclude the recovery is still somewhat fragile, uh, subject to external shocks to the system, like what might happen in Europe later this year if the recession there deepens and pulls us along with it, or if growth in Asia and China slows, or if we have a sudden increase in energy prices, would not be good. What, what about our own industry? Well, I think you're aware that we're facing a significant burden of new regulations. A whole body of existing proposed regulations is going to put, I think, significant pressure on power costs, particularly for the industry's coal fleet. Uh, we're looking at a situation where most coal plants are going to have to retrofit. A number of them may decide to close. To date, there have been 26 gigawatts of announced closures, with more probably to come. Uh, estimates of total closures range from 40 to 80 gigawatts of capacity. Some real questions about how we're going to deal with that. It looks like most of it will probably be replaced by gas. Fuel switching to gas looks like a fairly significant trend in our industry, certainly in the short term, probably in the medium term, perhaps beyond. But there's still a lot of questions about natural gas. I mean, after all, it, it emits less greenhouse gases than coal, but it's still a greenhouse gas emitter. It's really not clear how long uh, it's going to get a free pass from the EPA or, or perhaps Congress. And then there's questions about natural gas prices. You know, if we're looking at a significant amount of fuel switching in our industry, that's got to put some upward pressure at some point on gas prices. As one of our members is fond of saying, the surest way to see $8 gas is if everybody builds gas plants planning on $3 gas. So there's some truth to that. And there, there are other factors that could impact it, um, a little more speculative perhaps, but I don't think we've heard the end of regulations relating to the whole fracking process that has you know, freed up all the shale gas and has brought prices down. 
As you may know, the Department of Energy is also considering a number of export licenses. It's already approved one. If all those licenses are approved, it could be a significant impact. Of course, it's going to take a few years to build these terminals, but longer term, it could be an impact. And gas prices are so low right now uh, that there are some companies that are looking at actually investing upwards of a billion dollars or more in gas to liquid plants that actually use natural gas, convert it to uh, diesel and, and jet fuel. So, you know, all, all these things I think raise questions about the price of gas in the future. And if we have a situation longer term where gas is more expensive or there are more regulations relating to its use, then it's likely we'll see increased demand for other resources, energy efficiency, renewables, nuclear power. Well, can we meet future demand growth with just those resources if we're building few, if any, gas plants and no coal plants? Well, perhaps. I mean, I think each one of these resources certainly are making a contribution, can make a contribution, but I think they all come with some questions about their future potential as well. In any event, I don't think we can characterize what we're looking at today as an all of the above energy policy. Now, many in Washington say we have an energy policy that's all of the above, or say we should have an energy policy that's all of the above, but we don't. Our current regulations and proposed regulations pretty much preclude the development of new coal capacity. Now, is it possible that could change in the future? I mean, if we have difficulty uh, expanding these other resources, renewables, I mean, they, renewables definitely come with some integration issues. Still some questions around nuclear power uh, and perhaps gas. So. Again, perhaps. You know, that's, that's not really clear. But what is clear is that coal is our most abundant domestic energy resource. It's not as volatile as gas. And if we don't burn it, other countries will. In fact, uh, right now, U.S. coal exports have nearly doubled in the last five years. So if you'd like to hear a little more about natural gas and coal issues, I would point you to our program on Tuesday. We have sessions both on the future of natural gas and the future of coal. Other issues, other trends in our industry, workforce turnover. You know, we've been talking about this at APP conferences for at least 10 years. And I'm hearing more and more about it from our members because what's happening is, you know, the baby boom generation, that, that retirements are starting to accelerate. You're starting to see senior managers, senior professionals, uh, vocational skill craft workers, all levels in the organization begin to retire. And it's going to accelerate. It's going to become an increasing challenge for our industry. Technology, likely to play a very expanded role. I don't think I need to tell you that. And we're looking at advanced grid, hopefully the potential for enhanced, improved energy storage, electric vehicles, small modular reactors, distributed generation, among others. Another trend I think is very significant that we really need to be thinking about and talking more about are the expectations of our customers. We're seeing some real changes in this area. Some of it's prompted by, you know, new technology. As a lot of our members and others in the industry implement advanced grid measures, smart meters and the like, can provide services on the other side of the meter. That's going to shape and affect customer expectations. But the other factor is the entrance of third parties into what traditionally have been our exclusive markets. Right? Companies like Google, for example, who see some real value, some real market potential in future revenue streams in providing services to our members in this area. And the other thing I think we have to be cognizant about is the level of customer service that is now being provided by other service providers, some of whom traditionally have not had very, very good customer service, have really raised their game. Cable companies, telecom companies, right? cell phone companies. That's going to influence uh, the, what our customers expect from us, and we need to be thinking about what our strategies are for dealing with it. So, standing back and looking at sort of the overall trend, you know, in 25 words or less, we're looking at an industry that's growing in complexity, where the power is likely to become more expensive in real terms, and in which customers expect more of their electric utility provider. And oh yeah, by the way, you know, all this is happening against a backdrop where our customers and our policymakers really don't understand our industry very well. Don't really understand what it takes to provide reliable, affordable service 24-7. Just complicates and compounds uh, the industry's communications challenge going forward. So, uh, challenges for public power. Well, these trends, 
of the industry certainly apply to us. And there are other uh, factors relating to our business model, I think, that present some challenges for public power. We talked about the industry complexity. You know, that manifests itself in terms of keeping pace with the technology changes and following the, the growing body of regulatory requirements and the needs to comply with those and how you do it, what your strategy is. Uh, the complexity makes communicating with your customers and policymakers more challenging, making sure they understand the challenges we confront so they can understand why our, we're responding the way we are and we can gain support for those measures. I worry in particular about a lot of our smaller systems, right? We have 2,000 public power systems. The median size of a public power system is about 2,200 meters. Okay, we have about 1,000 systems smaller than that. Okay, so those that aren't affiliated, that aren't in the service area, say, of a federal PMA, or TVA, or a member of a joint action agency with a support network they provide, you're very concerned about how they cope with the pace of change and complexity that they'll be confronting. I talk about economic pressure on local governments. I don't think I need to tell you how that manifests itself, right? You know, when the well, local government has financial problems, they quite often turn to the utility. Quite often you see demands for increases in transfers. Sometimes those increases just aren't sustainable or compatible with maintaining a reliable operation or competitive rates for the utility. Or when the city has to cut costs, they get the flu, the utility gets the flu, right? You know, if they're going to freeze salaries, you freeze salaries. If they're going to cut travel expenses, you cut travel expenses. Long term, not good strategy, not a good way to maintain a competitive system. I've talked about the impact of regulations and workforce. I, I won't go into that in more detail. Rating agencies. I think a lot of you are aware of some of the rating agencies are applying more stringent rating criteria, creating some real pressure on a number of our systems. And then finally, the challenges of governance. Right? Local ownership, local control, clearly one of our strengths, if not our greatest strength. But if the governance isn't conducted properly, it can be a liability. I mean, I think the, uh, the challenge that all of our systems face to one degree or another is working with their governing body to make sure that you make good, sound business decisions. Not letting political influences and other factors get in the way of that. Not easy to do, increasingly harder to do. But you know, if you're looking at a situation where you've got an unsustainable transfer, you're unable to get support for necessary rate increases to maintain reliable service, if you don't have a, a competitive compensation structure to allow you to, to weather the changes in the workforce, those are all going to undermine the strength, the competitiveness of the utility. So I think this governance issue you know, is one that has to be a priority for our senior management going forward. Have to work closely with the governing body to facilitate sound business making, decision making, right, in an increasingly complex environment. That will allow us to derive, you know, maximum advantage from the benefit of local, uh, local control and make governance an asset and not a liability. And we're trying to work on these. A part of our response at APPA is to help the members in this regard. We have a half a dozen priorities we're working on in 2012. Two of them are directly related to this. Focus on regulation, not only in the environmental area, but also in the reliability space, and issues and challenges relating to our business model. In the workforce area, our, our most recent effort is the formation of a partnership we call Strategic Power Partners uh, with Hometown Connections, which is a subsidiary of APPA and a uh, well-known, well-established uh, recruiting company with good ties to public power. And the goal of this is to work with our members, both large and small, find well-qualified, experienced professionals and managers with public power experience to help our members fill key vacancies as they occur going forward. We're also working hard. We've established and we're maintaining a good dialogue with the rating agencies. We meet with them, interact with them on a regular basis on all issues affecting public power. And then on the, on the business model, uh, we formed a kind of a, an ad hoc group last year, business model task force, uh, composed of a number of general managers, CEO level, uh, members from around our member systems. And we've gotten some really good input, some really good ideas for things we can do to help in this regard. One of the results, one of the work products of this effort has been an updated model city charter, we call it. Uh, this is a document that 
basically is a compilation of best practices and how you would structure and govern a public power system you know, going forward. And it was just completed last month and is now available on our website, something you may want to take a look at. I would commend it to your attention. And we face some other challenges as well. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but these are some challenges in the federal space uh, as a result of federal policies or, or rulemakings uh, that apply primarily to public power. The uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, last year they adopted uh, what's called a minimum offer price rule that I, I want to bring to your attention. Um, very complex history on this thing. Let me just say that the upshot of this thing, among other things, what this rule does is eliminate the exemption that public power and co-op systems have for the right of self-supply for capacity in the PGM capacity market. This is an RTO that serves most of the mid-Atlantic area. And what this means is that public power and co-op systems have to bid their own capacity into the capacity auction, which means if it doesn't clear, they have to pay twice for their own capacity. This is clearly unacceptable, unfair, we think a direct threat to our business model. EPA, long list of issues with EPA, but the one I would highlight is despite, I think, APPA making a very compelling case in comments and meetings with EPA on the Mercury Rule, which was released late last year, making the case for needing more time in order to comply. We weren't taking issue with the substance of the rule so much as the time needed to comply with it, given a lot of the process requirements of public power systems. The final rule did not include any additional time. Very disappointing. CFTC, Commodities Futures Trading Commission, entity we haven't had to deal with in the past. But as you may know, they're issuing a lot of regulations relating to swaps and derivative contracts, which many of our members employ to hedge uh, primarily the price of natural gas. Well, they failed to carve out public power as part of the special entity category. So the same limits and rules that apply to other end users in our industry do not apply to public power. The upshot of that is it limits the number of counterparties that are likely to want to do business with public power. Department of Energy, in March, Secretary Chu issued a directive to the four federal power marketing agencies. It would essentially transform their mission and, in our view, threaten the prospect of affordable cost-based rates for the power they provide to over 600 public power members. And finally, in the area of fiscal reform, as you're aware, uh, Congress and the administration are at least talking about the prospect of fiscal reform and tax reform. And in that environment, we're concerned that tax exempt financing is at risk. And we're responding to this as well. I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, it's available on our website and our publications. I would just highlight a couple of points. At EPA, for the first time in our history, the association has filed suit against EPA. That that really wasn't meant to be an applause line, but okay, I'll, I'll take it. Um, but it's because there are actually federal statutes unrelated to the Clean Air Act, I won't go into all the details, that require them to follow a process to consider the needs of public power systems. And they didn't follow it, in our view. And so we're filing on that basis. We're working with other interested parties on this carve-out issue to make sure we're treated the same as other end users in the industry. And in PMAs, uh, since March, We've testified before Congress. We convened a PMA summit last month, attended by nearly 100 people. Thanks very much for your support on this. And uh, working with our members and our friends, the co-ops, uh, we helped orchestrate a letter in opposition to the DOE initiative that was signed by over 160 members of Congress, both houses, both parties. And finally, on taxes and financing, we're working with other parties like the LPPC and the Public Finance Network to educate uh, members of Congress and the administration on the importance and the value of tax exempt financing. So we're busy trying to, trying to help. Been talking about the public power business model. It might be good to define our terms. I don't know that there's any one right definition. This is my take on it. We're locally owned and controlled. Right. I mean, we're that's, I think, uh, probably the centerpiece of, uh, of our business model, a great strength. We're, uh, we reflect the community's values. 
We're good at matching local resources with local needs. We have a strong customer focus. Our customers are our owners, our stakeholders. We have a competitive cost structure. We want to work to preserve that, access to federal preference power, access to tax exempt financing. Our not-for-profit status enhances our competitive structure as well. We have an emphasis on reliable service. Reliability is job one. And we care about the environment. We want to do our part to help the environment going forward. So this model has served public power well for over a century. And will it going forward? Well, you know, I think it will. I mean, we face some real challenges, uh, unprecedented challenges. But a lot of those same challenges are faced by the rest of the industry. And I think we enjoy advantages and strengths relative to the rest of the industry. For one thing, historically, our members have been very good at executing our business model. Now, this is, this is going to be increasingly challenging going forward, I think. But ha as we've done many times in the past, I'm confident we can rise to that challenge. We have a very strong track record. Our local control has enabled us to have a strong track record on maintaining financial integrity and developing resources to meet our needs. I talked about reflecting community values. I mean, I think interacting with your customers, your policymakers, with your employees, absolutely essential. Most of our members do that very well, very important. Reliability. I mean, we stack up well against everybody in the industry. I mean, not only with respect to specific reliability metrics, but our response to outages has been exemplary. And in many cases, has garnered national media attention in the wake of a number of weather events in the last year. Maybe some of you have seen that, that press coverage. It's been terrific. And we enjoy competitive rates. Now, that's something we need to continue to maintain. Here's a, a, a graph that shows the results of 2010. We enjoy about an 8% advantage relative to the IOU sector. Other strengths, uh, I mentioned our interaction with the community. You know, I, I think that's something that we need to really work on and cultivate. I think we start from a good place, but I think we're going to need it more than ever going forward. We're looking at the likelihood of the need for some rate increases in order to confront and, and deal successfully with the challenges I've been talking about. And that's going to be very important to gain support or at least acceptance by your customers of the changes you'll need to make in terms of rate increases and other, other steps. And finally, we have a lot of flexibility and a strength in the financial area. You know, we're, we're going to be looking at the need to retrofit, to renew and replace infrastructure going forward, new capacity going forward, and the ability to 100% debt finance and to have strong credit is, I think, a real asset and a strength of public power. Uh, here's a graph that shows the most recent report from Fitch Ratings. Uh, it's very similar for the other two rating agencies. We've got about 250 credits that are rated here. As you can see, our, our median credit rating is A+. Plus. About 80% of these credits are A or higher, 30% are AA minus or higher. That's about four notches on average higher than the IOU sector, and several notches beyond that compared to other corporate credits. Virtually every one of these credits has at least a stable, if not positive, outlook. So this is something that I think we can bank on. It's a real asset going forward. I thought you'd be interested in seeing this. Why do rating agencies rate us so highly? It gets back to my point about, I think, the strength and the advantages inherent in our business model. If you look at these factors, this is taken from a recent report, uh, three of them, local control, um, the cost of capital, and rate payers being the owners and ultimate stakeholders, those are integral parts of our business model. And they're viewed as assets and strengths by the rating agencies, and they are. And then finally, we have a real intangible, I think, and it's the people in public power, represented well today by the folks in the audience here, governed by policymakers that are purpose-driven, not profit-driven, very competent, well-qualified, capable managers, and dedicated and skilled employees. And so when you take all this together and look at how we're positioned, uh, I think there's reason to be confident and optimistic about the continued success of public power in the future. This is APPA's missions and values. Uh, this is something that was developed in concert with all the APPA staff. We try to live these values every day. We want to be an integral part. We want to be a meaningful part 
of the efforts in assuring public power's continued success. I would just say how much I appreciate the APPA staff, how privileged I feel to work with them and lead them. It's not only a very talented group, but they're very dedicated, very energetic and enthusiastic in support of this mission. Let me just uh, conclude by saying that I think the value of membership in APPA has never been higher. If you look at our membership numbers, that tends to bear that out. We're at just under 1,700 members, which is the highest in our 72-year history. Uh, so if you're a, a member of the organization, thank you very much for your support. If you're not, I hope you'll join us in the near future as we work to address the interests of public power. So again, uh, thank you for your attendance and participation here today. We really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you.